Welcome everyone. Um, I'm Lauren and I'm here with Rachel and we're going to go ahead and introduce ourselves quickly first for anybody who doesn't know both of us and our blogs. Rachel, go ahead and let everybody know uh, where you're from. Hi, I'm Rachel and uh, as Lauren said, and I blog at a mother far from home, a mother far from home .com, and I help moms to take the chaos out of parenting. So I talk a lot about all the different areas that affect our lives when we become moms with young kids. Um, so it's exciting and it's a bit crazy, but it's fun. So that's part of what we want to talk about today is how to take out a little bit of that craziness that isn't fun. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I'm Lauren. I blog at The Military Wife and Mom, and I write about practical parenting, enjoying motherhood, and then I also do blogs about surviving and thriving throughout military life. And it's it's not just for military spouses, it's for all parents, really. And I have two kids. They are almost three. And then my daughter is almost eight months now. So um, it's always interesting and an adventure around here. And mm -hmm. one of the things that we have have found, Rachel and I both, that works really, really well for us is to use really short, quick bursts of communication in our parenting. And we're going to share with you seven genius phrases that can change your parenting today. And I'm going to guess that if you're here, you have struggled with listening or power struggles or tantrums. I think those are issues that resonate across the parenting spectrum. No matter who you are, your parenting philosophy, those are things that we all struggle with. And um, we're going to talk about the phrases, and these phrases are all coming from our book called Helpful Phrases, How to Gain Cooperation from Toddlers and Preschoolers Without Lectures. And the best part about this is these phrases are going to empower you to have smoother days, um, more relaxed parenting, and we're going to show you the research behind these phrases and why we would want to use them. And then... Um, we'll show you some printables with the phrases on it so that you can have really easy access to all of these phrases and You know have them right at your fingertips and then cue your brain and say oh, yeah That's why I want to use that phrase when we're in this type of parenting scenario, you know before bedtime the battles We'll tell you a phrase that you can use during that time um, with dinner time battles We'll share a phrase with you that you can use during that time so just kind of a fun way to approach parenting without putting a lot of stress or a lot of work into it. And we're going to show you some PowerPoint slides and I'll, I'll set up the presentation and then we'll just alternate between the phrases and, and share with you how they all work. Okay, so I'm going to just bring it up here and then I will screen share with everybody. And I have, while Lauren's doing that, I have, right now I have four kids and I'm pregnant again and doing a couple of months and my oldest is, uh, their ages are five, four, two, and one. So when I say that we, we love helpful phrases, I really mean it because, um, especially when you have quite a few kids, you need to be able to get their attention and you want them to all be on the same page. So one of the reasons, um, it'll come up more as we go through that phrases, um, short phrases are so helpful is that once you start using them and repeating them, they become almost little family mottos. And then you find you don't have to go on and on and on. You can pop up a phrase and the kids remember it and it helps them cooperate so much instead of trying to reinvent the wheel every time. So that's part of um, where we were going when, when we wrote our book. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'll go ahead and click over to phrase number one, Rachel, and then you can go ahead and share what you wanted to talk about with that phrase. Okay. Can you see it? I can't see the phrase number one. I just see the, um, the title page, which says, yeah, seven helpful phrases. Oh, okay. I clicked over to the next one. It did not show up still. Well, I'll talk about it if you want to see if you can get it up there. Okay, I'm seeing it. Oh, okay, okay. Well, the first phrase, number one, is, there we go, I see it now, is okay. let's try that again. 
Now, the reason this is helpful is because we all know one of the biggest um, things that all parenting experts and psychologists and, you know, they, all the they's say that is so important with young kids is um, consistency. But that doesn't always mean that every single time they do something they shouldn't, that we have to get them in trouble, quote unquote, because kids do things quickly and compulsively. And then you can often see your little one's face like, uh oh. So the first phrase is, let's try that again. And what that does is give them a chance to redo what they were doing. So, um, and this also, why this is important, um, Lauren has written based in it's you're criticizing what, or it's in process criticism rather than person criticism. This means that you're not saying, I can't believe you did that. Rather, why don't you do that action again? That action wasn't good, try another action. So this also helps them to think about what did I do? What can I do differently? So for example, if a child, if my son snatches a toy from his brother, then his brother might fall down on the floor and wail with a tantrum or something, you know, and I can look at my son and say, let's try that again. And then give him a chance to actually give it back to redo, so to speak, what he did. So this also helps your child to take action defensive. So if you just say you shouldn't have done that now, you're going to get in trouble. Then they maybe they wanted, to, maybe my son was like, but he took it from me in the first, you know, it, it, you're kind of going over their emotion and not allowing them to express what they wanted. And this is when you get big power struggles. Now, of course, we know the mom is the mom. We need to be sort of over, over on top of their behavior. But let's try that again is a perfect way for you to still hold tight to your boundaries but give them a chance without fearing they're always going to get in trouble to do what they know they should have done. It's really helpful when they do something quickly, compulsively, and when you can tell they're, when you know that they're sorry and you feel like a, a consequence, it was just too, too much in the moment. Do you have anything to add about that, Lauren? No, no, I love that. That's great. Um, can you see phrase number two now that I clicked over to the next slide or no? I can't see it yet. There might be a little delay. I still see number one. Hmm. I don't know why it's doing that. I can just give it like this. Maybe. There we go. I see it. I see it now. It might have just been a delay. Okay. Do you see the slideshow or do you see um, the whole PowerPoint program? Oh, the whole PowerPoint. Okay. I will just leave it like this so that we're not clicking in and out of it. I'm not sure why the slideshow isn't showing properly on the screen share, but maybe it's a glitch. Anyway, um, phrase number two is, I will, I'll know you're ready when. So this is a great phrase to use if you find that your kids ignore you or you're, they're really resistant to your direction. Uh, kids they kind of move to their own clock and they see the journey just as important as the destination. And this is a huge struggle for parents, especially for myself because I'm very type A and I have a tendency to want everything done yesterday. And kids just don't see life like that. <laughs> and they see it very differently. And, you know, they see this one dandelion and they need to see, sit and look at it and play with it for five minutes and you are 15 minutes late for an appointment. So they don't understand that, but I'll know you're ready when is a really great phrase to use in a, the types of situations where you're getting ready to leave or you have some sort of transition coming up. A great example of this would be um, when you're getting ready for dinner and you want your kids to wash your, their hands, um, but they're already at the table. You'll say, I'll know you're ready for dinner when your hands are clean. Or you're getting ready to leave the house and the kids are being all crazy. I'll know you're ready when your shoes are on. Or they want to go to the park. I'll know you're ready when your shoes are on. You could really use it in any type of example, but those are some great situations that I found this phrase to work in because it puts the ball in your child's court to go ahead and take action, similar to the phrase that we just said before, and it disengages you from that power struggle. Um, instead of saying something like, why aren't your shoes on? We gotta go, hurry up, get moving, those types of things. And as soon as you say, get moving, it's like they take 
10 times longer on purpose <laughs> because they just don't want to do what you say. <laughs> It's so frustrating. So this is a great alternative um, to try when you're trying to transition to another activity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and I think it's also great, particularly if you're wanting, if what's coming next they want to do, but they're taking a long time, you know, I'll know you're ready to go outside and play when you have your shoes on or, you know, then it kind of gets them focused on the goal. Just like you said. I agree. Now, this phrase number three is a good one. This is one of my favorites. Now, I know, of course, I want to say everybody has different food and eating strategies in your home, and that's fine. You know, you just have to do what works for you. Um, but we decided in our home long ago, we wouldn't do that. You have to try this amount of this amount, or you have to eat your whole plate. Because, again, like I said, we have four kids. We're about to have five. I mean, if I was, I had to keep a spreadsheet of this plate's been out since breakfast and lunch, and I have to have labels and all kind of you know what I mean? That's just, that's too much for me to, to make sure that everybody is forced to eat something. So the tag we took is that, um, because, and this is true, so you don't have to eat breakfast, but there's nothing until the mid-morning snack. Um, or you don't have to eat the snack, but then there's nothing again until lunch. So what it does is it takes out the power struggle. You're not trying to force them to eat it so they don't feel forced to eat it. And this the same way as adults. Nobody likes to be forced to do something. Of course, we know, again, the parents are the parents and we know what's best for our children. So I'm not saying we're going to let our children just choose to do what they want. But the fact is the kids aren't going to starve themselves. They're really not. And they know when they want to eat and they will eat something they don't like when they're really hungry. And so this perf this just prevents the battle. So you can say, at, so for example, at dinner, um, it, if they just sort of don't like it or they've had a couple of bites and then you can just say, you don't have to eat it. There's nothing else until breakfast. And they're saying, and sometimes I, I, my daughter will say, okay. And then she'll go to bed and she won't eat dinner. And then in, in bed, she'll say, I'm hungry. And I'll say, I know this is, you know, you didn't have to eat dinner and you didn't, you'll get breakfast in the morning. And she'll say, I get hungry if I didn't eat dinner, you know, so she's putting it together, but yet she's able to choose. And again, then she might wake up for breakfast and eat tons because those, um, but one of the points is this allows you to skip bribing. And so you, yeah, you're not bribing. Like if you eat all your vegetables, then you'll get dessert or because then you're only trying to force them to do something sweet, if that makes sense. So then you still, which it's not that in itself that is necessarily bad, but what we want to do is, again, put the ball in the kids' court without us having to constantly force, force, force. You get two, three kids or even more than eat that or you can have this, eat that or you can have more bites or you can have this. It all gets a bit too much, you know, instead of just let's sit down and eat or you don't eat and then that we go from there. So I have found dinner time to be far less of a battleground with this phrase. Yes. Um, yeah. The next phrase that we're going to talk about is, excuse me, I'll be right back. So one of the biggest struggles that I hear from readers is, how do I get my kids to stop coming in my bed at night? Or how do I get my kids to fall asleep on their own? And I think with toddlers and preschools, preschoolers, this is a real legitimate struggle because now you have a little person with their own thoughts and ideas and they can climb out of bed and they're not in the crib anymore and they can open doors. <laughs> so <laughs> even when you put them in their bed, it doesn't mean they're going to stay in their room. <laughs> it's really, really frustrating. So this technique and this phrase was developed by sleep behaviorist John Kuhn. And here's how the excuse me phrase works. The first night that you're going to try this phrase, you want to go ahead and push bedtime back. And you want to start with this just at bedtime, even if you're struggling with naps. Just start with bedtime and go ahead and bump bedtime back, you know, by an hour or two so you know that your kids are good and tired. And then, you know, in the hour before bedtime, try to really get them to mellow out, you know, turn the lights down, keep the stimulation low. And then, you know, you're going to get them all comfy cozy in the bed and get them laying down and you're going to use a lot of positive reinforcement. And you're just going to describe exactly what your child is doing. 
you got your legs laid out in the bed, you got your covers on, you're doing a great job staying in bed right now. And you're not even telling them to go to sleep or anything like that. And then once you get them all settled in the bed, you're going to say, oh, I forgot something in the bathroom. Excuse me. I'll be right back. And you're going to leave for a couple of minutes. And you're going to do whatever you're going to do. And then you're going to come back. And then you're going to say, wow, you're laying so nicely in bed. You got your covers on and you got your pajamas on. You're just kind of talking to them. And then you do it again. And you say, excuse me, I'll be right back. I forgot something. And you walk out. And you're kind of going to have to go through this quite a bit on the first couple of nights. And it's probably going to take a while. And that's the frustrating part is really just sticking with it for the first um, couple of nights, which are the hardest. And you're going to come back and forth at random intervals. And the ultimate goal is to allow your child to fall asleep while you're in one of the excuse me moments. And... This is just what the most positive technique I've honestly ever heard with teaching kids to fall asleep on their own. You're right there kind of coaching them through it, but you're not really telling them to go to bed or fall asleep or it's time or anything. You're just, until they get it down on their own, you're just saying, excuse me, I'll be right back. Mm -hmm. And you can use this with night wakings too. If you have a toddler or preschooler trying to come into your bed at night and you're trying to break that habit, you can go ahead and try the excuse me technique again. Mm -hmm. And um, what the researchers found was that anywhere from seven to 20 days, there was a dramatic decrease in wakings and um, there was an increase in the child's ability to fall asleep on their own. So it depends on your child how long it's going to take them to learn to fall asleep on their own or to stay in their bed at night. But this is a great phrase to use in those types of situations. And you can make up any excuse you want. I mean, you could even kind of get silly with it if you wanted. Um, I'd love to hear, we'd love to hear how it works for you if you end up trying it. Yeah, and I want to say this, uh, this phrase also really worked if you're trying to teach your um, toddler or preschooler to play independently. We have our kids play in their room or you know, somewhere for maybe an hour with their own toys. And often if they've never done this before, then they fight it. This is a great phrase to use then. Um, you know, you play with them for a little bit. Excuse me, I'll be right back. You know, then maybe you come back in a few minutes and maybe the next time it's 10 minutes and 20 minutes until they learn you will be back. They're not abandoned. You're just, you know, and in the meantime, they learn to play on their own. So I would also try to use it in that scenario if your child struggles playing on their own. I totally agree. Okay. Phrase number five. Go ahead, Rachel. You can do it all by yourself. Now, this is a great one because kids have this, I see it in my kids' faces, they have this simultaneous desire to do it by themselves and a fear that they can't do it and they want you to help. So, um, especially if this works if you have a child who get, who's nervous or, or uh, reticent to start and try to do something. So this helps them feel more independent and confident. And the way that you start doing this is you, you're, you don't just, you can do it by yourself. I'm gonna go drink a Diet Coke and read my book, you know. You, you can do it by yourself. And I'm right here, I'll be right beside you, you know. So complete the task on their own, the full task. You can kind of encourage them and talk them through it and praise them through the little parts. So. My kids always have to make their beds before they get out of their beds. And now for my two-year-old, that just means putting his pillow in the right place. My now four-year-old will straighten his toys and fold a big blanket. But he w he used to struggle with flattening out the blanket, he calls it, so that he could fold it. So then I would say, you can do it. You can do it all by yourself. First, we just need to lay the blanket out. And then he would lay it out. And then he would say, but it's crunkled, you know, because it doesn't lie flat. And then... I would say, oh, it is crunkled. You know, you can do it. You can go to that end and straighten it out. And then he would go straighten it out. And then he, in between each time, he'd look at me with his eyes wide. like I did it, you know. And now then he would do one part. You did it. You did it all by yourself until at the end he's folded it. So this is a great way to help them start things you know they should be or could be doing on their own that they aren't. And so, and because you're with them, you know, you're standing by them. You can do it on your own. Put one more foot up. You know, if they're trying to climb up a chair, put one more foot up. I'm right beside you. You know, if you need me, I'll be here. But you can do it on your own. It, again, puts the ball in their court, helps them feel like they can do it. But you're right there with them. So it gives them that encouragement to try. 
is a great a great phrase and especially if you have quite a few young kids close together like I mean obviously that's my perspective so I do so anything they can do on their own I need them to do on their own doesn't mean I'm not around it just means if they can I could spend I said the other day I probably spend or I could spend three total hours a day getting everybody water because they're thirsty you know so if they can get water my two-year-old even when he was just barely two He'd push a chair up. I, I taught him this. You can do it on your own. You can get water. You just push the chair up to the sink. So push the chair up. You can climb up on the chair. Climb up on the chair. You can get the water. He'll get himself water from the sink. Now, you, you'll know your kids and what they can or can't do, but it really helps them to get a sense of self as well. Yeah, we use that phrase every day in our house. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Phrase number six is, it's okay to feel nervous. And you can replace nervous with any feeling that your child is having at the moment or whatever feeling you're guessing that they're having and if you get the feeling wrong though your kids will correct you <laughs> um, yeah. but children often think that you know the fact that they feel nervous or upset or sad or angry means that something's wrong um, or that they shouldn't do something try something or continue to move forward with the day. Um, so by using this kind of statement that has like no shame or stigma, it's okay to feel nervous. We're letting them know that whatever they're feeling at the moment is completely valid. Um, some examples of this would be, it's okay to feel nervous. You don't want to go to see the doctor. You can stay right next to me the whole time. Mm -hmm. It's better than saying, you know, you're nervous, get over it. We're gone. Um, because, Kids will continue to communicate until they feel heard. So that means mm -hmm. if they're feeling nervous and nobody is able to recognize that for them and communicate it or reflect it back to them, they will continue to on and on and communicate on and on. that yeah, in ways that isn't verbal. They'll have the tantrum in the parking lot. They'll have the meltdown or the power struggle until you voice that feeling for them because they don't know what to do with it. It's going all crazy in their head and um, they can't articulate, I'm nervous, I don't want to do this because of X, Y, and Z to you because you know their brain is still developing and I mean, heck, even adults can't even really articulate their feelings most of the time. <laughs> so isn't that the truth? So just go ahead and say, it's okay to feel nervous. It's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel angry. Um, you know, I'm going to be right here with you the whole time. And, we'll, you know, you can go, you know, stay right next to me. Or, you know, we can wait until you feel ready. Or whatever you feel is most appropriate, you know, parenting moment. But just go ahead and validate the feeling and say it's okay to feel however you're feeling. And the joy of this phrase, I love this one particularly, is because, um, you know, in, instead of saying, I know you're scared, we're doing it anyway, saying, yeah, you it's okay to feel scared. Um, it's, it's, it's almost the same thing. It's just nice. Does that, you know, I mean, um, right. I know you're scared, we're doing it anyway. It's sort of kind of mean to them, but I know you're scared. I do this with my son often. If he says, I feel scared, I'll say, I know you feel scared, but it doesn't mean you're not brave. Being brave is when you're scared and do it anyway. Oh, you're scared then you don't have to do it oh you're tired you don't have to do it no it's keeping the boundary but it's just it's validating their emotions like you said so it doesn't mean you're not um requiring them to do what they might need to do it just means you're helping and you're kind of bonding with them almost and allowing them to to be okay with how you feel, you know, and it really makes all the difference in cooperation because kids know deep down they're going to have to do what you want them to do. But if you're making them without hearing them out, like Lauren said, they'll just on and on and on and on until they're sure that you know. <laughs> so this is a much easier way for them to feel accepted, even though they know that, that some they have to do, even if they do feel nervous. Exactly. Um, phrase number seven. Go ahead, Rachel. Okay, so one thing we want to, there's been quite a bit of um, research out on this in the last years, um, 
it's about the power of praise. Okay, so what we want to praise our kids or how we should praise our kids or the best way to praise them. And um, one thing that, that research has shown, which is a bit ambiguous, is good job. Uh, you know, it comes out of our mouth so easy. Oh, you did that all. Good job. Good job. Um, and so then we, it's a quick way we can kind of affirm them. But the problem with good job is, first of all, it's not very specific. So one of the big things that they also teach teachers, this is, has a lot of educators in it, is it's always better to praise something specifically. So if they got down and put their dishes in the dishwasher, it's not just good job. It's thank you for putting your dishwashers in. Duh. Thank you for putting your plate in the dishwasher. Um, or appreciate you putting your plate in the dishwasher. So you're affirming the behavior that you want them to continue. Good, just kind of what was good job about it? Did I do it fast? Did I close the dishwasher right? Did I, you know, they're not quite connecting it. And the half of the point of praise is that you continue and to repeat. So it, this phrase, if you just constantly say, good job, good job, good job, it can kind of make them be dependent on your affirmation instead of helping them feel good about what they've done. So, I mean, it, and, and, now, and honestly, a good job kind of just is an easier to say. It's quick as opposed to having to be specific. But even with small ones, if they color a picture, oh, I like the colors you chose. I like the uh, eyes on the monkey that you drew or whatever it is. You're kind of pointing out to them something specific so they actually feel that you did notice it. And this, um, I don't want to call it a research wave, whatever, whatever it is, the, the body of research that's coming out now about praise is that um, you want to praise them for their effort as well. So that's why it's not just enough or it's not doesn't really do the trick to say good job. You want to hit on the fact that they tried to do something. I'm proud of you for trying. I'm proud of you for going even when you didn't want to. I'm proud of you for doing that even if you were nervous. So then they're able to think about what you said. Oh, I know what mommy likes because kids intuitive, they want to please their parents. Might not feel like that all day long, but inside, of course, they want to please you. And so knowing what is pleasing to you or in general helps them to repeat that. So it can be a bit hard at first and it can feel super cheesy too if you're not used to it like um the real, we have little kids we're like in the land of cheese right so it's just you have to push past that and just <laughs> be as specific as you can it truly makes a difference in their behavior and you'll see it in their eyes how they light up you know it really praise is really especially specific praise is really helpful to, to small children yeah and in Help All Phrases, we have over a hundred different ways that you can praise your child without using good job or you've won. Uh, and just a few of them are, you did it that time, or look how far you've come, or one more time and you'll have it, or you can try again tomorrow. One that we use in our house all the time is you are kind and gentle because my son likes to give his baby sister the biggest hugs ever <laughs> and um, so we try to focus on that kind and gentle behavior so you're kind of gentle uh, instead of just saying good job being gentle or you know good job not squishing her <laughs> so okay so now we're going to talk about a freebie that we have for y'all today um, go ahead, Rachel. Yes, so we have a free printable with all the phrases, with all of these phrases together. Um, you can down down at the bottom of the page somewhere, you should be able to access it. Um, and let us know if you have any troubles, but it'll just download instantly for us. So you can print it out and keep it around and just, you, you know, I don't know, put it on the refrigerator or the playroom or something and use it to just help help you to remember that Yeah, it's not, it doesn't have to be that complicated. We can take little phrases and we can use them enough that our kids latch on to them and communication can be so much easier. Yeah. It's just a really quick parenting win, you know? Exactly. And then, of course, there's more because um, we are launching Helpful Phrases this week, so we decided to run a special and... People kind of thought that we were a little bit, 
you know, this is kind of a big freebie that we're giving away with bundling both of the books together, but we decided to go ahead and do both the books for the price of one for our launch week special. So um, anybody who get, grabs a copy of Helpful Phrases during launch week is also getting a free copy of Routines, Rhythms, and Schedules. And mm -hmm. in Routines, Rhythms, and Schedules, there's 30 different sample schedules and routines that you can print off as well to help your family find something that's gonna work for you to cut out the chaos and to help streamline and structure um, something that's gonna fit your needs, you know what I mean? And yeah. then with Helpful Phrases, the book also comes with 10 printables. So it's over 40 printables that you get with both books, which is amazing. And I think that's the part that the, our readers have loved the most um, with, you know, from readers that we've had that we've been able to share this book with before it launched and then with our routines book, that's really the biggest thing that we hear is just the printables and simplifying it and just so you can have easy access to the information quickly so you can get those quick parenting wins uh, without right. having. And both books are really quick read. Um, we're really busy moms and we know that you don't have seven hours to sit down <laughs> and read a novel. <laughs> And that mm -hmm. was the intention and the motivation behind these books is we wanted to offer something really simple solutions for moms out there who want to do something practical with parenting, but don't have a lot of time. And yeah. did you have anything you wanted to add, Rachel? Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say, and they really, they do go well together also because part of Wake's communication with our toddlers and preschoolers easier is when they know what to expect. They understand what comes next, what comes, you know, what, what's expected of them. And so part of part of what can help you it doesn't seem logical, but part of what can help have better communication with your young ones is 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 a good routine. It doesn't mean it has to be super strict or by the clock or whatever, but that's why we called it rhythms, routines and schedules, because there's some rhythms that don't go exactly with the clock, some that are more you know, we do this in the morning, in the afternoon, whatever, but they really go well together. And the routines book has routines from babies. I think it's about six weeks or six months, something, six weeks till five years old and also multiple children routines. You know, how, what can you do with your baby or if you're nursing your baby, what to do with the, the toddler or how to get them to do independent play. So both books are really chock full of super helpful, quick, quick, so to speak, you know, like immediate satisfaction wins um, in the Helpful Phrases book as well. So we know that it'll be really valuable. So we just wanted to kind of put it together this week. And it's this week only, this week only, yeah. and, and Saturday. And then um, we'll go back to their regular price and continue to, to sell on Amazon and our website. So thank yeah. you guys so much for joining us. Um, I hope that you got something out of it that is useful for you to use in your parenting and go ahead and download the free printable that comes with on this page and you'll find it just scroll down to the bottom and um, come back and see us again. It was great having you.